Welcome back, everyone, to well, uh, to Media Apocalypse, our series about the threats facing journalism, news gathering, and the flow of information on matters of public concern in our democracy, and dedicated to exploring solutions, both legal and otherwise, for preserving the press function. We are absolutely thrilled to have with us today Jamil Jaffer, who is the executive director of the Knights First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. Under his leadership, the Institute has filed precedent-setting litigation, undertaken major interdisciplinary research initiatives, and become an influential voice in debates about the freedoms of speech and press in the digital age. Welcome, Jamil. Thank you. Um, first question, uh, just as an introductory question, I was wondering if you could tell us, um, uh, the audience also, um, what the major litigation efforts um, you have, um, uh, your, your institute um, has launched in the Trump era and um, maybe your biggest victory and your most stinging defeat. All right, that's a lot. We have 45 minutes, right? So, uh, okay, so, so uh, let, let me just start by saying um, something briefly about the Knight Institute. So, you know, we're, uh, as all of you know, a relatively new institute uh, on the scene. We are now four years old. Um, the Institute was the brainchild of Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University, and Alberto Ibarguen, who's the president of the Knight Foundation. And they established the Institute four years ago to uh, promote free speech in the digital age. And uh, I was lucky enough to be brought on board as the Institute's first director. And we are uh, now much bigger than we were four years ago, but still a very small organization. There are 20 of us, uh, including 10 litigators. And we have focused on you know, three areas primarily. Um, uh, and the areas are so broad that you could quite justifiably complain that they're not really a focus at all. But the three areas are uh, first, free speech on social media, second, um, uh, privacy surveillance and free speech or the intersection of the First and Fourth Amendments. Uh, and third, transparency, um, principally of government actors, but also of powerful private actors who are increasingly gatekeepers for public discourse. So those are the three, you know, the three big areas. And we work through litigation, research, and public education in all the, those areas. Um, in terms of the, the most significant litigation projects, um, uh, the, the one that's certainly furthest along and has probably got the most attention is uh, our challenge to President Trump's practice of blocking critics uh, from his Twitter account. And we have now brought a series of cases uh, against public officials who have engaged in viewpoint discrimination on uh, social media platforms. And those cases are really an effort to take public forum doctrine that was developed offline and move it, you know, move it online to these spaces that in our view are uh, increasingly important for, you know, for our democracy. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about the, the Trump Twitter case, so I won't say more about it now. But uh, that, that was the first big case we really we, we really filed, and now it's uh, the government cert petition is pending before the, the Supreme Court. Uh, we've also brought challenges to, uh, we have a big case challenging the pre-publication review system, which is the system that uh, requires former intelligence agency employees to submit their writing to uh, their former agencies uh, before publishing it. So if you, you know, once worked for the CIA or for that matter, you know, any of 16 other intelligence agencies, um, then you are forever required to run your manuscripts by government censors before you, you know, before you publish them. And there is a kind of, you know, logic to this system. The, the government says we need to be able to protect our secrets and Often the people who are writing these manuscripts don't know um, as well as they should what is secret and what's not. And this system is meant to allow us to, to, to ensure that secrets aren't disclosed inappropriately. But the system is now uh, sprawling. There are millions, literally millions of people who are subject to it 
um, it's plagued by long delays, it's um, politicized, and we are challenging the constitutionality of it in, in, in court. Um, I'll just mention a couple other projects, you know, more briefly. Um, we're challenging the constitutionality of the State Department rule that requires millions of visa applicants to submit their social media handles to the government when they file their visa applications. Um, that case is still in the district court. We're waiting for an oral argument date, but uh, represents a big investment of, of time and energy on, on, on our part. Um, uh, what else? We've done a, a bunch of stuff relating to speech at the border. Um, for example, laptop device searches at the border. Uh, these questions about, you know, what standard the government needs to meet in order to search a journalist's cell phone or laptop when he or she returns from abroad. Um, uh, and then on, uh, I'll mention just one more on, on transparency issues. We have a series of cases um, in which we are arguing that the Office of Legal Counsel, which is, as all of you know, uh, a component of the Justice Department that writes legal memos that are the binding law of the executive branch, they're essentially treated as Supreme Court opinions within the executive branch. Uh, we're arguing that, that when that office writes final formal legal opinions, it has an obligation under the Freedom of Information Act to disclose those to the public, even in the absence of any FOIA request. Um, the argument is essentially that those opinions are working law, and because they are working law, the public has a right to, to see them, uh, even without anybody, you know, filing a, a, a letter with the government asking that some particular memo be released. So that's, you know, um, those, those are some highlights from our, from our litigation docket. I mean, I guess the, the, the most significant victory is probably the the Trump Twitter uh, case, which we won in the district court, we won in the Second Circuit. Um, we survived a government petition for rehearing on Bank, and we are hoping that the Supreme Court will deny cert um, uh, later this month. That's probably been, been the biggest, um, certainly the highest profile victory so far. The most stinging defeat, well, there, I mean, there, there's a lot of competition for that one. Um, <laughs> but all, all, my, all my defeats are stinging. But <laughs> I, I would say, I was very disappointed with the decision we got in the pre-publication review case in the from the district court. Um, you know, we 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 knew from the beginning that it would be a difficult thing to convince uh, the lower courts to rule our way because there's a Supreme Court opinion uh, from 1980, I think, uh, called United States v. Stemp, which um, people say as a kind of shorthand. Uh, upheld the constitutionality of the pre-publication review system. And so in the lower courts, we have to persuade the judges that that opinion doesn't actually mean what people have often said it means. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought we actually put together a pretty good argument and um, uh, but apparently not good enough. <laughs> so yeah, we didn't, we didn't win that in the district court, but we're now in the fourth circuit and I am optimistic we'll do better there. Okay. Thank you. That was an unbelievably um, helpful response. And so, I'm, I'm, when I asked you this question, I think I, I think I know the answer. But if you could um, expand on what I'm thinking about, <laughs> that would be great. Um, so, you know, as a um, non-First Amendment um, person, when I first read about the litigation against Trump blocking um, uh, critics. Um, and I thought to myself, well, that seems like a rather small potatoes. That is like, who the hell cares? I mean, you can find, I mean, uh, you know, yeah. you can find out what he says. Everyone knows he says, everyone reports about it. So the, the question is, why did you yeah. launch that kind of litigation? And I, I, I suspect it has something to do with the strategy about trying to, um, uh, uh, apply the public forum doctrine um, uh, in, in uh, for yeah. social media, but maybe that's wrong. But uh, I, no. I would love to hear what you have to say about that. No, well, your your reaction to the case was my reaction to the case when we first started thinking about it. You know, um, uh, I thought, you know, who really cares whether Trump blocks people on Twitter? It's just Twitter, and um, it's also information that you can get from so many other 
places. Um, and this was, you know, the first big case we filed as an institute. So there was, you know, a real question about kind of positioning the institute. Do we want to, you know, start with Trump and Twitter? And even the Trump part was something that I wasn't sure was the right decision because we were, you know, when, when, when Lee and Alberto founded the institute, they weren't thinking about Trump. You know, Trump was uh, not on anybody's radar screen at that, at that point. They were thinking about these larger structural trends that are affecting our system of free expression and you know um, new technology, new surveillance technology, um, the privatization of the public square, um, you know all um, the use of the First Amendment as a kind of deregulatory tool, those kinds of trends, you know, and um, making our first case about Trump was, um, it wasn't obvious to me that that was the right, the right decision. But we thought about it, you know, a lot. And uh, the more we thought about it, the more we thought, you know what, this seems trivial when you uh, first approach it. But the, the more you think about it, the more you realize that this is really a crucial set of questions. Um, these are, you know, it used to be that political leaders engage with their constituents principally in places like town halls and city council meetings, uh, school board meetings. That's where people had one-on-one -on -one contact with their representatives. That's where they heard from their representatives directly what their representatives were doing or going to do. It's where they got to respond to their representatives directly, where they got to petition the government for redress of grievances. You know, that's where it was taking place. Um, and it's also where citizens used to interact with one another about government policy. You know, there's a kind of social aspect uh, to it. And all of that has moved, well, maybe not all of it, but a lot of that has moved online now. And all of that is taking place in spaces like President Trump's Twitter account. And, um, uh, you know, one thing that people don't often focus on when they think about Trump's Twitter account, everybody focuses on Trump's tweets, right? But Trump's tweets are only one aspect of that account. There's also all the replies, people responding to Trump's tweets, and they're the replies to those replies. So people just having conversations amongst themselves about the government's policies or about Trump's statements about government policy. And, um, you know, obviously not all of that discourse is at sort of the highest uh, level of political debate, right? Um, but this really is a, a space that is akin to a kind of offline town hall with President Trump at the front of the room, um, citizens assembled in front of him, uh, shouting back at him in response to his speech and talking to one another about his speech. And the idea that government officials can exclude people from those spaces simply because those people have disagreed with government policy, um, you know, in my view, that sort of contravenes the, the core protection of the first, you know, that's what the First Amendment is really supposed to be about. You know, you can debate a lot of other things, like whether they're supposed to be protected by the First Amendment or not, but this is, you know, if the First Amendment covers anything, it covers, um, uh, this particular kind of government um, misconduct. And, um, you know, eventually we came to see this as a really important uh, case and a really important principle to try to establish. Um, you know, that case was about Twitter. Now we're, you know, now we're talking about other platforms as well. And that case was about Trump. We have another. We have a bunch of other cases involving lower-level officials. We litigated a case in the Fourth Circuit involving um, the chair of the uh, Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. Um, you know, so this is happening at every, you know, at every level. Um, and that particular political leader was a Democrat, not a Republican. You know, um, so it's not just you know one side of the aisle either. And um, I, you know, I, I feel strongly now that this is, um, this case is uh, a kind of important statement about the, not just statement, uh, important protection for the integrity of these uh, 
these spaces that are increasingly important to our to our democracy. Well, thank you so much. That was an, that was really um, a helpful answer. And um, just tell me where I donate. Um, <laughs> um, um, I'm gonna um, Jack. Jack is back, um, uh, and so I'm gonna hand you over to Jack. Thank you, Jamil. Uh, Jamil, I I wanted to follow up on exactly where Scott left off, uh, and ask you how you think about a litigation strategy that is not only about the First Amendment, but is also, we might say, First Amendment adjacent. And here's what I mean by this. One way of understanding the Trump Twitter litigation is that you could understand it as a 21st century version of petition. That is, relationships between citizens and governmental officials. So pet petition clause is the, is the 18th century version of that. But so much speech will not be between citizens and government officials it will be between different citizens. And there won't be necessarily a, a government official intervening. And so the problem then is going, to, is going to be, there'll be a whole series of other free speech problems that will exist on privately owned infrastructure, especially social media, but won't involve a government official uh, sticking, you know, involved in the conversation. So that means you have to fight for First Amendment, you have to fight for free speech values. I use the term advisedly, even though those values uh, don't involve a First Amendment cause of action. And indeed, you may find that the First Amendment is on the other side of your fight for these free speech values because the uh, owners of private infrastructure will claim the First Amendment as a defense to almost anything you've come up with. Yeah. So I'm interested in how you think about a First Amendment adjacent litigation strategy uh, in addition to the sort of updated version of a petition clause strategy that has been successful so far. Yeah, uh, I mean that that is the core challenge um, for for us. You know, we're a First Amendment institute uh, established at a time when the First Amendment is not actually a great tool for uh, addressing the kinds of free speech concerns that seem most urgent. Um, and so, you know, there. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about both of the challenges you alluded to, Jack. So one, one is uh, how can we push the, the boundaries of the First Amendment so that um, we can use the First Amendment not just against government actors, but in some context against some private actors as well. And, you know, that, um, I'll come back, I'll come to one example of that in a second. But then the other, the other challenge you also alluded to, which is that there's a kind of defensive game too, which is, um, you know, if the First Amendment is not a great tool to address some of these problems because the problems are caused by private actors rather than public ones, then we're going to have to rely on government, you know, on legislation uh, or regulation to address those problems. And then um, somebody's going to have to defend that regulation or legislation against First Amendment challenges brought by the uh, the people who are being regulated. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, which, which of these laws or these proposed laws could actually be defended under current doctrine. Uh, and how does current doctrine need to change in order to create space for laws that in our view are important to um, uh, ensuring that First Amendment rights or free speech rights can thrive in the digital age. So on, on the first set of challenges, um, um, and we represent these um, journalists and researchers who study the social media platforms and they study the social media platforms using digital tools that um, are pretty basic digital tools, but you kind of need them in order to study uh, digital platforms at scale. I, you need to be able to scrape the platforms. You need to be able to use research accounts on the platforms, what Facebook might call fake accounts. Um, but there's really no, you know, no way of- I see you're moving click, uh, directly where I thought you'd move, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, yes. uh, as well as, as contract law. That's right. right. Well, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is the easy part, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, then there's a question, well, are these, con so there are terms of service that uh, foreclose the use of the, prohibit the use of these particular digital tools. And the effect of those terms of service is to allow Facebook uh, 
to prevent journalists and researchers from doing journalists, uh, journalism and research focused on Facebook. So Facebook becomes the gatekeeper to journalism about Facebook. Yeah. And um, you know, we have no First Amendment or no obvious First Amendment argument uh, in, that, you know, in that context. Although if any of you have ideas, I'd you know, love to hear them. Um, uh, and then there's a contract that Facebook is relying on to justify its interference with the work that our journalists and researchers are doing. And we sent a letter to Facebook about 18 months ago, kind of alluding to um, uh, void for public policy argument. You know, we said to Facebook that, you know, to the extent you're relying on these terms to uh, squash journalism focused on Facebook, you know, journalism that would allow the public to better understand the digital forces that are shaping and distorting uh, public discourse, um, you know, we question whether those terms are um, are enforceable or whether they are void for public policy. We didn't expand on that very much in the letter we sent, but it's something that we've been you know, we've been thinking about, and it's a kind of effort to develop a tool beyond the First Amendment to address some of the the threats that we see as you know most most significant now. This actually uh, brings me to a general point about uh, public interest law firms, uh, and you'll see for in a second how it how this history relates to what you're doing. Public interest law firms have generally found it easier to bring rights claims than to bring claims that defend government programs. The reason why is the government already has lawyers who are going to defend its government programs. So what you need are ways of arguing for private rights outside of claiming First Amendment rights. So one way to do that, of course, is through defenses. So you can defend yourself against a charge that you're violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Another way is to, and that, that the, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act should be interpreted so as to preserve the First Amendment, free speech rights, how shall we say, of journalists and others. And also that contract law uh, should be interpreted in such a way uh, consistent with public policy, the public policy here being, of course, free expression. And so it seems to me, though, it's not uh, hopeless, quite contrary. You just have to see how you can work through other bodies of law and argue for certain kinds of statutory interpretations, uh, certain kinds of carve outs and exceptions based on free speech principles. Because at the end of the day, you're really going to be bringing a litigation to defend rights. Now, they may be statutory rights. They may be defenses against statutory claims. But that's ultimately what you're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, that sounds right to me. Um, I think that defenses against statutory claims is going to be especially important. Um, well, defenses of government programs, um, you know, that, that kind of work is going to be especially important. Um, and if it's the kind of Supreme Court we have now. Yeah, if it turns out we ever pass comprehensive privacy legislation, who knows yeah. if that'll ever happen, then that will give you another tool in your toolbox because then uh, privacy legislation is a way that you can uh, use as a lever to basically litigate private rights uh, against you know, other folks, including corporations. So in some sense, what you have to do in the 21st century is you have to think of creative ways to use other bodies of law uh, and other statutory frameworks to basically promote free speech values. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's right. Um... You know the the privacy legislation or like the Honest Ads Act, you know these these uh, these bills that would impose transparency requirements on the technology companies, like all that stuff is going to be challenged on First Amendment grounds. Um, you know the the main um, internet privacy law is already being challenged on First Amendment grounds by some internet service providers. Clearview, which is scraping you know photographs from the Right. Uh, from the internet and the service of a facial recognition app, to, app is uh, defending itself on First Amendment ground. So the, the kind of defensive game, I think, is uh, I'm not sure that defensive game is the right way to put it, but that sort of um, limiting the First Amendment, I think, is an in increasingly important uh, task of organizations whose goal is not necessarily the biggest First Amendment possible, but rather the best, the best First Amendment possible. 
Right. It's a, it's a, it's not pro First Amendment or anti First Amendment. It's a fight over different conceptions of right. what the First Amendment is, and also I take it free speech values that aren't encoded in or embodied in the First Amendment, which is really increasingly yeah. what the 21st century is about. Thanks very much, Sandy. It's a slight tech loop there. Hi, Jamil. Thank you, and thank. Hi, Sandy. Uh, I want to shift you to another piece of the First Amendment that means in a lot to me, quite near and dear to my heart, and very much behind the impetus, if you will, for this series and conferences that may come out of the issues we discuss in these various conversations we have with people like you. Um, I could put it under the umbrella of the press clause. Um, and here's my question for you. Um, and to some degree, it's coming out of the very most recent decision of the Ninth Circuit in the uh, Portland case, um, the newspaper versus the US Marshals. Um, but, but that's just the most recent iteration of this question of the press versus public in terms of their rights of access and their rights to be free from government interference with their functions. So I don't know if you've given this some thought, but I'm rather hoping to have, and if not, it would inspire you to do so, which is, do you see any unique roles for um, the press playing in our modern democracy? Unique, that is, from the general public. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to follow it up when you say yes or no. Uh, but, but, um, what if I say I don't know, Sandy? Because that, that that is the the real answer is that I've been hoping that uh, you and Ronell and Sonia West will educate me on that particular topic. Uh, you know, we we so we we sent a letter to. Um, the attorney general uh, around th this is not this is not an answer to your question, but it's not just filibustering either. It um, you mentioned this Portland case in which one of the issues was uh, uh, disclosure and you know, right of access. Um, I think that part of that I haven't actually read the opinion, but I think part of the opinion. Uh, says that the police have to identify themselves, right? They have to wear uh, badges or insignia. And you know, we sent a letter to the attorney general um, maybe four months ago at the height of the protests in DC, of the Black Lives Matter protests in DC, um, after federal officers had been deployed in DC without badges and insignia. And we made, uh, two arguments, neither of which relied on the press clause, but two arguments um, uh, for the proposition that federal officers should be required to identify themselves you know, with badges and insignia and, and, and ID numbers. And the first was a kind of bantam books argument. We made a kind of uh, an argument that the deployment of these officers without identification, uh, identifying insignia, and ID numbers was intended to coerce protesters from exercising their First Amendment rights. So it essentially was meant to intimidate protesters into not exercising rights that they had a constitutional, uh, that their you know, rights that were constitutionally protected. That was the first argument. And that one I think, you know, was relatively straightforward. It was really, you know, came down to a factual question. I think if we had been able to establish that that was part of the motivation for the deployment of troops without uh, officers without insignia, I think we probably would have been able to uh, win in court. The second argument we made was more ambitious. We made the argument that uh, there was a right of access, that the uh, there's a public right of access to the information that was not being shared by those officers who were deployed without insignia and badges. And uh, essentially tried to argue, you know, we were trying to argue that um, this particular information about government should be 
uh, within the category of information that the public should be understood to have a constitutionally protected right of access to just because of the importance of this information uh, to the public's ability to hold government officers accountable, uh, but also because this information was crucial to the ability of ordinary citizens to initiate uh, government proceedings that would be subject to a constitutional right of access, even under the narrowest understanding of uh, the right of access. And we didn't get to litigate these questions because um, not for any reasons having to do with our letter, but just a few days after the letter, those uh, officers were uh, withdrawn from, you know, from DC. Um, but that's just all a long way of saying that we had hoped to litigate some of the same issues that eventually got litigated in, in Portland with a slightly different set of uh, legal theories. But my short answer to your question is I don't know. I, I don't know. We struggled with that question when we were representing these journalists and researchers who are studying Facebook because we proposed a safe harbor proposal. We, we went to Facebook and we said, um, even if generally you're going to prohibit people from using these digital tools to study the platform, you should create a safe harbor uh, for certain kinds of, and then we weren't sure whether to fill that in with for certain kinds of journalists and researchers uh, or to fill it in with for certain kinds of journalistic and research projects. And we ended up doing the latter. Um, uh, we felt like we, you know, there was no good answer. Both answers were bad and we were trading off, you know, um, uh, e each of those answers came with problems that we didn't have full solutions for, but ultimately we decided to go with the project, you know, focus on the, the nature of the inquiry rather than the, the identity of the inquirer, because we thought it was safer to put that kind of um, power in Facebook's hands than to give Facebook the power of deciding which journalists and researchers would call, qualify for the safe harbor. Um, but that's just to say we've struggled with the question. I don't know, you know whether we landed on the right answer in that context, and I certainly don't know the answer to this broader question of what role the press clause should, you know, whether it should play a role, because as we all know, for the most part, it doesn't play one under our existing doctrine. Well, I, right now, that's certainly correct. I mean, and what is striking in the Portland case, which is for those who, in, who are, might be watching, listening, and don't know as index newspapers versus US Marshals um, and the Ninth Circuit, is that they go through so much talking about the unique and important role that the press plays in society. But they're very defensive to some limited degree in their way of, of noting that, that it's a public and press set of rights, in this case, the right not to be hassled by, or worse. I mean, you know, what was going on in Portland was, of course, the distinct targeting of um, certain NGO members, observers, and press. Um, and so you see this tap dance in a lot of cases, and unless you don't think that there are specific functions that professional journalists and press play that's distinct from the public, I would urge you and your colleagues to help us think through how to articulate those functions and then perhaps seek a strategy for defending them. Um, possibly within the Knight Institute um, docket, Jamil? I, I'm all for it. I think we should, yeah, we should talk. Um, uh, it, it is, it's, it's on a list of issues that I, I feel like I should know a lot more about than I do. And, um, you know, one, one of the, the, the challenges for us at the Institute is that, you know, we, we have been you know, defending press freedom was one of the reasons we were, you know, established. That's uh, what but, I recalled. Yeah, but, but, well, you were involved before I was in sort of the conversations about the Institute, but the, um, you know, we are also supposed to do impact litigation. And most of the press cases that come our way, 
um, are right of access cases that don't uh, on their face seem to uh, present the opportunity to create broader law. They're important cases. They have to do with, you know, reporters need information to tell particular stories and they're being denied that information. And those stories are crucial and timely and urgent. They're important cases, but the fact that a case is important doesn't mean that it's a vehicle for, right, for, for establishing new law. And, um, you know, most of the cases we brought have not been on behalf of journalists or media organizations. Uh, I mean, they're all First Amendment cases, but they're not, um, they're not press cases, let alone press freedom cases. The, the project I mentioned earlier, where we're representing journalists and researchers who study the social media platforms, that's kind of exceptional. Um, you know, the number of cases that we had brought so far uh, on behalf of journalists uh, is, is very small. Um, and I would like to think about uh, how to change that. And if you can help me with that, I would, I'd be grateful. Well, I think, I think we should undertake that as a challenge on our end. Um, I, I think coming out of the Trump administration, and I suspect you might agree, and the hostility that's been generated against the institutional press, that there's going to be an even greater need to try to define what those functions are that we really do value and decide are really critical to our democratic form of government. And then a litigation strategy with folks like you as to how we go about creating a judicial environment for it, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, with that note, um, I, 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 I will turn it over to Ronnell and thank you for me. Yeah, thanks, Jamil. Thank you so much for being here with us um, and for helping us think about sort of all of the complicated moving parts here. Um, one of the things that really strikes me in talking to you is that um, several of the examples that you're giving of the work that um, the sort of real in the trenches work that you're doing are um, in some respects about uh, are, are tackling the exact same thing. This is the exact same intersection of like the um, privatization of the public sphere and the um, and the accountability and watchdog function um, that we think of as so crucial to democracy, right? And so um, the Trump Twitter litigation on the one hand sort of tackles that from uh, the ways that it's altered the government side of the equation and the work that you're doing um, on research tools online, right, in the capacity of journalists and researchers to be able to think in that space is thinking about how it's um, tackled, you know, the news gathering or information gathering side of it. But they're they're both really about that complicated confluence, right? That the the weird dynamic that we find ourselves at, where we've privatized our public sphere, and we're still trying to think really hard about um, accountability and watchdogging. And I wonder if you could just sort of boil down for us, uh, if you were, if you're just sort of saying to the average citizen or better yet to the average sort of regulator <laughs> who's trying to think going forward at this critical moment where, we, where we're facing both this kind of changed communication media landscape and this changed political landscape, what are the um, what are sort of the the biggies, the big things that we should be most concerned about and keep our our eyes on in terms of um, maintaining that core value of accountability and government watchdogging? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, well, okay, so let let me uh, let me answer it this way. So so when, when I think about the um, the digital public sphere and the, the health of the digital public sphere, right? We every week there's a new debate about like um, you know the most recent one was the New York Post articles um, about Hunter Biden and the way that the the social media platforms responded, um, uh, and and each one of these debates sort of highlights a different part of the problem or maybe a different, you know, a different problem with the sphere. Uh, but the ones, you know, there's some kind of constants over time and, and the, the problems that I think of as most significant 
Um, I would say the concentration of power public discourse in the hands of a very small number of private corporations um, that are accountable, you know, by design only to their shareholders. Um, so that's one, you know, that's one problem. And it's a problem of centralization, right? Um, then there is the problem of um, uh, surveillance. Um, you know, the fact that the business model of many of those companies involves pervasive surveillance, not just of their users, but of everybody else as well. Um, uh, and that that surveillance is not subject to the checks that government surveillance might be. Uh, so that, you know, that's a second problem. Um, related to both of those is the opacity of these private actors. Uh, you know, we know very little about the decisions they make. They know very little about the, the effect of the decisions that they're making. Um, and we know even less than they do. And, um, you know, because I, I trace the problems of the digital public sphere to multiple causes, uh, including the three I just mentioned, I don't think that there's a single, you know, there's a single solution. To, I think we're going to need uh, more aggressive enforcement of antitrust laws. We're going to need um, more creative use of anti-monopoly tools more generally. We're going to need um, uh, legislation that requires disclosure and due process on the part of these private actors who, um, you know, who wield so that, that wield so much power over public discourse. Uh, we're going to need comprehensive privacy legislation. Um, one constant uh, with all of those, you know, proposed solutions to the problems I identified is that the private actors in question are going to challenge all of those things on First Amendment grounds. Like they're all going to be subject to First Amendment challenges to the extent those proposed, you know, those ideas are already embedded in actual legislation. They've already been challenged on First Amendment grounds. And we have courts right now that are, uh, in my view, unfortunately, receptive to these very broad, you know, these arguments um, that uh, construe the First Amendment's coverage in you know, very, very broadly. And uh, I think it's, you know, we don't have a, a mature enough public conversation about the First Amendment. Um, I think that when people hear that the First Amendment was an obstacle to something, they think that's, they tend to think that's a victory for free speech. And I don't think that that's always true. And increasingly, I think it's not true. Um, uh, I think increasingly you have free speech on one side and the first amendment on another, on the other side. And these two things have been put in opposition. I know that Jack is gonna correct me. He's gonna say free speech is a triangle, but I, um, for my purposes, the important thing is that free speech and, and the first amendment are not always, you know, uh, aligned and, and and the studies the First Amendment is saying to themselves, well, this is not a new thing. Um, you know, it's uh, that's always been uh, the way. Um, it, you know, it's always been that way. Uh, but I think it's it is more that way now, uh, and it's more that way now in part because uh, these private actors play such a big role in shaping or manipulating or distorting public discourse. And in part because of what's happened to first to the First Amendment over the past forty years, um, you know the courts have expanded the First Amendment in a way that gives um, uh, that creates the possibility of uh, uh, inter, inter First Amendment cla clashes uh, much more often. Right, it's much more often the case that you have now. You know, uh, any of these cases involving. The social media companies involve the users who are asserting the First Amendment right to speak. You have the listeners who are asserting the First Amendment right to hear those users. And you have the platforms who are asserting the First Amendment right not to be regulated. Um, and you know the dispute here isn't between the First Amendment and something else or free speech and something else. It's, as Jack said earlier, it's a dispute um, about different conceptions of the First Amendment. And 
again, I mean, I, think, I don't think that's news to anyone who studies the First Amendment, but, but I think there's a lot of distance between the conversation that takes place um, in the academy and the conversation that takes place about the First Amendment um, on editorial pages and, you know, in the newspapers. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that I hope the Knight Institute can contribute to is narrowing the distance between those two conversations. I think that's super helpful. Um, we're almost out of time here, but I have a question that I want to pose to you in part because we it's a common thread. It's a question that we've posed to lots of folks in lots of different conversations who have come at this um, from a lot of different angles. And it's not squarely in your wheelhouse, but um, one of the reasons that I want to ask it of you is because you are so much on the forefront of this uh, sort of core question of how to serve that accountability and watchdog function, right? The, the, the sort of criticality of that function and how to serve it in this new age. And one of the things that we've been exploring here is, is um, this sort of broader question of what the role of government might be and whether we might Im imagine um, government support for journalistic endeavors or that press function endeavor um, as, as setting up um, some mechanisms uh, to preserve that press function going forward. Um, we appreciate that um, at this exact moment, sort of asking that of government is um, maybe laughable, right? Particularly given the kinds of watchdog and accountability issues uh, that you see with the, the present administration. But thinking more broadly, um, is that something we should be thinking about? And is it something um, that you think would be valuable? Um, are there hiccups um, or road bumps that we should be considering from, from the vantage point of the space in which you work? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I think that we should be thinking about it. I think it would be valuable. I think th the structure of it is a, you know, is a challenge. Like, how do you structure it in a way that um, um, addresses First Amendment concerns? I don't just mean that, you know, the, formally the First Amendment doctrinally is a problem, but there are some very legitimate concerns, I think, about, you know, giving, investing in the government the power to, um, you know, shape um, public debate that is often about the government, right? That the, the whole point of the First Amendment from a particular, you know, perspective was to keep the government out of that business. And uh, now we're proposing putting the government into it. But uh, I do think that, um, uh, you know, what, one of, so we now have uh, Ethan Zuckerman as a uh, visiting researcher at the Knight Institute, and one of his focuses is digital public infrastructure. This question of, you know, what kind of, um, you know, offline, the government creates all kinds of infrastructure that support, uh, directly or indirectly, indirect, supports um, the conversations that are necessary for self-government. Just gives a space to, you know, we have public parks, we have um, public libraries, all these things that, you know, make it possible for us to um, uh, have a democracy that actually, that actually works. And what does that look like, you know, online? And um, that was, Ethan wrote a great piece for us for a symposium that we hosted last year on the tech giants and monopoly power and public discourse. And that piece has now grown into um, it's its own uh, project and Ethan is now putting together a symposium and we're gonna have a you know, call for a proposal shortly uh, to focus on this question of digital public infrastructure. Um, but yeah, I think it's hugely, it's hugely important. I read this piece, you, you, you guys may have read it as well. E, uh, Eli Pariser had a piece in Wired just a few days ago um, lamenting that the internet doesn't look more like Fort Greene Park and Fort Greene Park is actually my park. It's just down the street from here. Uh, and I think he's, you know, he's right that the world would be much better if the internet looked that way. And anything we can do to push the world in that direction, I think would be a good thing. Thanks. Uh, let me uh, hand things back to Scott. Thank you so much, Jamil. This was absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, thank you for <laughs> The good work you do, the great work you guys do, and also for um, being on the show to talk to us about it. Thank you very sure, much. Sure, I was happy to do it. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.